I've made a few videos on RetroArch and I'm gonna make a few more, but I just realized that I have never done a very basic video covering what it is, how it works, and just going through all of the options. You gotta activate Windows because I know you want the dark theme and also the customization options that go along with it. Plus, you'll be able to get some updates that are not available unless you activate. So head over to whokeys.com. It's where I grab my keys. You can get Windows 11, but you know what? Windows 10 Pro right now, it'll update to Windows 11. So check out Windows 10 Pro. They've also got Office 2019. You can grab that. You've got Windows 10 Home if you want. And I've got a coupon code for 30% off until the end of the year. So if you need Office and Windows 10, you can get them together right here in a pack and save some money. I'm going to go ahead and add this to my shopping cart. Click here, proceed to checkout, and right here we can do a coupon code, TS30, hit apply. If you're watching this video after the end of the year, you can use TS25 to get 25% off. But I'll take the 30 right now because, hey, Q4, everything's on sale. Once you're finished, if you want to access your key, you click on your name on the top right, click on user center, and you'll see my purchase orders. Right here, you'll be able to view the keys that you've purchased just by clicking on view keys and codes. Then you will see your code right here. Just go ahead and copy this code, press start, type activate, and you'll see activation settings come up. Click on that, then click change product key. Right there, you can paste in your code and hit next, and then you will be activated. It's very simple. So go ahead and get Windows and Office activated and do it at the same price as the wholesalers do it. And if you've never used RetroArch, this is the video you want to start with, and then you can go look at the videos on how to do shaders and how to um, organize your libraries or just whatever else I make videos on how to play DOS games and stuff like that. So let's just hop in and do a total overview of RetroArch. Now when you first open it up, you'll see this menu and it's not very responsive with your mouse. Uh, this is designed to work with a controller. So I've got my controller right here. This is one of our Finnick wireless controllers. You can buy them on epicpants.com or you can use Xbox controller, PlayStation controller, whatever. Whenever you plug it in, it will immediately recognize it. This controller shows up as an Xbox controller. If you press um, and hold the home button, it will switch from Xbox into a generic direct input controller. But since Xbox controllers are recognized here, just uh, make sure that it's in Xbox mode. If not, hold this down for five seconds and it'll switch to Xbox mode. Now I'm controlling it with this. So first off, let's start at the main menu. Now under the main menu, you have options to load cores. Cores are what they call their emulation cores. So all of your emulators, like back in the day, remember ZSNES and uh, just everything like that, those are all considered cores. I don't even think ZSNES is on here, but that's where we got started, a lot of us. So load core and then load content. Now, which one should you pick? Well, you can pick either one. A lot of content has the same file type. Like if you have multiple uh, content that's ISO or if you have multiple zip files and stuff and you try to load the content, it will not know which core. So it'll ask you, which core do you wanna load? So that's what those two things are. Show the desktop menu. Now, if you press F5, this is what I like. Now I use this a lot when I'm on my PC. I just minimize the other one because it's much easier to browse your libraries. It doesn't have as many options, so I just use this to, you know, select my games after I've already configured everything here. So there's that um, system information here. Let's see what my network and my system information, what does it say? There's what we got. This is my beefy editing machine. There we go. Go back. Um, configuration files. You can save it, load them. If you have different, you know, you can set up multiple uh, configuration files. And this is cool if you wanted to have a different interface for a different screen. You could set up a different RetroArch config file. You don't need to, I don't do this, but you can. You know, we can load up a new one and select between the ones you want to load. So this might be good if you have a CRT or a side monitor, you wanna have a totally different interface on it. That would be okay. Or you could have a separate set of options for resolutions and stuff. There we go, restart and quit. So let's uh, go up and well, let's first off go to the online updater. And here you can download all kinds of different assets. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is download a bunch of cores. I'm gonna make a separate video talking just about the core downloader because uh, there's a lot of different cores here. Some of them are for special use, some of them for different things, and it's very confusing uh, when you first get started. You're, you're gonna be like, well, which core do I use for arcade? Which core do I use for, what if it's a Capcom arcade game? Okay, which core do I use for Neo Geo? How about Super Nintendo? There's a lot of options. So I'm gonna go through and tell you which one is gonna be the most accurate, which one's gonna have the most performance, and which one's gonna have the best options and allow you to pick 
uh, from that one. So watch the next video, and we'll talk all about the different cores you can download. And then I can, you can you know update your installed cores here. It's checking. Oh, I've, I've pushed the button. Now it's going to do this for a minute. I'll be right back. <laughs> it's updating all my cores to the latest versions of the core. Okay, I'm finished updating all my cores. Playlist thumbnail updater. Once you uh, scan all your different directories for your ROMs, you can do the playlist thumbnail updater and allow it to download different artwork, or you can just come here and just pick, you know, which playlist you want to update. Let's get all my N64 stuff. It's going to start downloading in the background while we work here and just download all the missing thumbnails and artwork and that sort of thing. Content downloader. So there's actually some open source games that you, you can grab. Let's see if there's anything on DOS. Hey, look at that. We've got these games that we can download and these will be downloaded directly here in this interface. You're not going to have to go out and look for those elsewhere and you can get different games there's even some open source nintendo games in n64 yeah we got some n64 stuff here and these are all just like mostly open source or free games that you can get and uh, download them you'll have to get all the regular roms on your own you can't download them here inside this interface all right update your assets there we go and then we have different controller profiles some of this i'm going to skip over just a little bit there we go and you can turn on on demand thumb load downloads um, but this if you have a bunch of stuff, it really can impact your, your performance as you're downloading. So what I usually like to do is organize my libraries and then manually update all my thumbnails. I mean, if, you really want, if you're only adding a few games and you have most of your library up to date, you can turn that on and have it update things you know, as you go. But I generally don't like to do that. Whoops, I've switched out of full screen. There we go. All right, so that's the main menu. Now we have multiple areas where there are settings. Settings here, drivers. So I would recommend not messing with this stuff very much, but you can change this to direct, direct input or X, X input. Since we're using an X input controller here, I'm using it, you know, leaving it on X input. There we go, you could raw input. So this is more advanced. It's, it's gonna work just out of the box. And then you can use different video drivers. If you wanna try Vulkan, you can, but I would recommend doing that per game and per core. Uh, like if you know a certain core works with Vulkan all the time, then you can change it. But if you change these drivers on the core level, a lot of stuff is going to break. So leave most of this alone. And then we can come back in and change this again, depending on which game and system we're playing. So that's the way uh, I think most people should do it. There we go. If you want to set up location and stuff, you can do that. So... The rest of the stuff I'm going to leave alone. Video. Again, I like to set up my games first and then come in and mess with this stuff. One thing I do keep off is the bilinear filter. When you're playing a lot of these games, there was there was blur on your old television sets. TV sets have Gaussian blur built in. And if you turn this on, ah, it will add a little blur around the edges of the sharp pixels because they don't look the way they used to. And a lot of people look at these things and they're like, damn, games didn't look as good as they used to. No, they used to look softer. A lot of the, the blocky parts of games used to blur together a little bit. So if you turn this on, it blurs the hard edges, but I prefer to do this with CRT filters that I'm gonna make a separate video on. Mess with this once you get your game up and running. So I'm not gonna mess with any of these things from a high level. Now, when it comes to input, I usually like to leave my polling behavior normal, but if you wanna mess around and see if you have less latency you can try you know early late whatever i'm gonna leave it on normal for now and we can mess with latency in other ways as well so this is pretty self-explanatory again the beauty of retroarch is you don't have to mess with a lot of this stuff so here's the way if you want to do this the nintendo way leave menu swap okay and cancel off turn it on and that'll swap the okay and cancel buttons here so that it'll be more like a playstation or xbox or whatever that style. Hotkeys. These are going to be keyboard keys that you use to basically control the emulators. These are not going to be compatible with every different emulator, every different core out there. Like you can't do quick save when it comes to Scum VM, which are all the LucasArts games and stuff like that, but you can do quick save in most cores. And so you can set up here your load state and save state buttons. Those are going to allow you to do a quick save in the game. And you also have save slots, plus and minus. So you can um, essentially change um, which save you want to, you know, like load save number one, save number two, save number three. This will allow you to cycle through the different save slots so that you can load up the one you want and you can have multiple quick saves in your game. There's our full screen toggle. You're not going to need most of this stuff, but remember a few things. Rewind, 
pause and frame advance. Pause and frame advance, once you get used to this, you are gonna use pause and frame advance immediately after you start any game. I guarantee it, and there's a big reason for it. You can cut down all of the input lag just by using these two hotkeys and a little trick I'm gonna show you. It's probably worth its own video, but I'll show you in this video just so we can get up and running. And then we can cycle through shaders. I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. You can scroll through here and see what everything is. All right, going back. Now we can change our controls. Once we click in here, it lets you select your type of device. Retropad with analog just means Retropad is basically uh, like a Super Nintendo controller. But then you have Retropad, Retropad with analog. That means we have these on the bottom. Now this is kind of cool because a lot of the original PlayStation games didn't have analog support. But with this, we have analog to digital. So what it's going to happen is it's going to transpose all of the movements right here. Oh, hi, Chewbacca. So what it's going to do, it's going to transpose uh, what you're, well, basically, I think with this one. It's going to transpose the movements of this to your D-pad. So that's what, it, that's what it means. Now, if you have a system, like if you're trying to play uh, GameCube or Wii or something, you're probably going to want to just turn this off because these are actually, you don't need to be mapping this to your D-pad, you need this to be free. Just remember that, there we go. And then the device index, I'm just using the generic 360 pad, which is this, our generic 360 pad. You can come down here and set all your controls. When you press this button, it's just gonna ask you, hey, what you know? What do you wanna set? Let's press the B button. Okay, there's a B button and there, Y, and then, you know, I, I'm just gonna hit escape here. Uh, I've messed it all up, but I'll just hit, Reset controls. Reset all controls to default. There we go. Using a pad without a home button, you will need to come in and just map this as your whatever your home button is. Luckily, since it's a 360 pad, our home button here works just fine to bring up the menu while you're in games. All right, let's go on back. Do the same with all the different ports, all the way up to five players. Did any console have five players? All right, latency. Top level, I like to leave the latency controls off, but this is a huge deal. Um, and they, they released this in the last couple of uh, versions of RetroArch. It allows you to correct input lag, and you can have an experience that's instantaneous. It does use your system resources, so you'll need a slightly more powerful system, but even a Raspberry Pi and stuff can play like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and remove all the input latency. It's once you start getting into the PlayStation and N64 that you're gonna need a really beefy computer. So this latency stuff is awesome. Very handy. If you're getting any stuttering with audio, you can try turning up the audio latency as well. But we, we are gonna do this on a per game basis and then save a file for that game. I'll show you when we get to that in just a second. You can change uh, settings for each different core, manage your different cores. Uh, we're gonna leave that alone for now. And then uh, this is very handy. You wanna make sure that you exit this program properly every time. If you crash the program or something, it generally won't save any of the configuration files or any of that stuff. When I have this on, it's kind of goofy. I mean, I know I can go in here and save it, but once I make a bunch of changes, I like to press my escape button twice, which exits the program, because I know as soon as it exits, it's gonna save everything. And then I just open it back up quickly and get back into it. So it saves all the stuff I just did. All right, we can change our saving settings, how it works. Most people are not gonna mess with this at all, but you can do incremental save states. If you wanna turn on like auto save while you're playing, if you forget to save all the time and you're always kicking yourself and you're an adult, which means you've got stuff to do, you don't have time to replay half of a game because you forgot to save, you can turn on the increment save state index and then you can set your save directory and that sort of thing if you wanna do that. I'm just leave all this alone. If you need uh, logging, this is more for developers or someone who has like, they're having errors and you need to go on the forum or something, you can turn on logging and then get a log output file. All right, this is our file browser settings. Not much to worry about there. I mean, you can come in and tell it to show hidden files and directories if you want to or whatever, but we don't need to, do, to, to mess with that. In this menu, we can change our rewind and fast forward and slow motion rates. So you have complete control over that. And even G-Sync and FreeSync. Um, so you can set that up, sync it up with that. And we can do lossless recording, or you can set up other codecs for recording. It's pretty insane, all the stuff you can do. I'm not sure if this is something that I think maybe 2% of the people are gonna use, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. And we have our OSDs, which is our on-screen overlay. And I like to adjust this per system. I don't have any of these set up right now, so 
but it's something you can mess with if you really want to. On-screen notifications. You can turn these on and off and then the notification visibility. This is very important if you want to take a lot of screenshots inside your notification visibility. So in order to get here, I went to on-screen notification. Okay, on-screen display, on-screen notifications, notification visibility, and all the way at the bottom of that list, we have screenshot notification persistence. Now, normally the screenshots are going to stay like the little notification is going to cover up a huge portion of your game and it's going to stay on the screen for a very long time. Put this on very fast. You'll get a quick notification of the screenshot and then it'll go away so you can take another screenshot. It's really important if you care about screenshots to do this. No one's subscribing. This is a lie. All right. So there's that. User interface. Color themes. Nord. I, I usually just like the, the basic black. Basic white. I know a few of those. See them every day at Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks every day. That was a lie. Now you can choose the type of thumbnails you, you want here in your appearance. I've, I've ignored a lot of this stuff because this is mostly, you know, subjective stuff you can turn on and off. Name truncation if you want full names or not. So the thumbnails, how those are going to display. Box arts. It's very obvious that you want, you know, this to show up. I dropped something over there. Or do you want a title screen? You know, this can be good for arcade games and stuff like that, but you, you want to set that up and then you can mess with the rest of this if you like. I leave the advanced settings on. If you put it into kiosk mode, that's going to change the way RetroArch functions. It's going to lock down all of these advanced features and just allow people to come and play the games, select which games they want to play, and they can't mess with things. That means they can't break anything. So you'll need to set a, a password for that whenever, you know, you know it'll, it'll ask you for a password whenever you go back into the regular mode. All right, most of this is pretty uh, self-explanatory. If you're using a touch screen, you can turn on touch support. We have mouse support, but like I said, it's a little easier to control this interface with a controller. Desktop menu, I have that turned on, or when I first turn on RetroArch, this pops up as well, because I always use this to select my different games and whatnot. And we have some text-to-speech accessibility options in here. Be interesting if they could incorporate some sort of a filter for colorblind. That would be cool, but they don't have that right yet, right now. Power management. If you wanted to set up some sort of power management, depending on your system, you can do that. There are achievements, and it's depending on uh, the core. You'll need to set up, you know, retroarchachievements.org. Go there, set up an account, put your name and password in. I'm actually not huge on achievements, but if you are someone who wants to add a little challenge to some of your older games, maybe for completionists or, you know, finding certain things, doing things in certain times, I don't know. You can turn on achievements and then uh, you can check which cores have achievements. Playlists, we'll get into that in just a minute, but you can control some of the settings. But since, since we haven't really talked about playlists yet, this is premature. All right, and then we can set up our directories, default directories and that sort of thing. Um, if you have a bunch of BIOS files for all of the different systems and stuff, you can come in here and put them. And now, another thing that's nice is sometimes I like to use this directory listing just as a, a guide to be like, okay, where do I put my stuff? Okay, and then you can get your own thumbnails and throw them in here if you wanted to. All right, so that's the settings memory uh, menu. We've got favorites. This is what I'm playing right now. So I haven't really added a bunch of favorites yet. Then our history as we go down. These are screenshots that I've taken here while I'm playing the game. All right, so there's a screenshot. That took a very long time <laughs> to open the screenshot. So I think I'll be browsing my screenshots with another program that just totally messed me up. So yeah, we can see all of our images, but I'm just gonna go inside your RetroArch directory. There is a screenshots folder. That's a much better way to do it. I mean, you could use this as a music and video player, but uh, no. There's your net play if you wanna configure that beyond the scope of this video. And then we have import content. So once you get your um, your ROMs and everything set up, you can go to scan directory. And if you're looking for ROMs, I can't tell you where to get them, but just look for no intro ROMs. That's what, that's what you want to look for. You can look on archive.org as a start, but no intro ROM sets is where you get, uh, that's, how, that's what you want to look for. So we can just do a scan, pick a directory here. <laughs> and then you can just say, like, I like to scan these one at a time because I'm weird. I mean, you could scan the entire thing all at once, but I'm pretty meticulous. As I like to go through and, like, set all my games up and then scan just that one directory and then take a look and make sure everything's good to go before I move on. And then once you scan them, you'll get these folders here. I haven't gone through and added all the box art yet, but this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like right here. So let's say we have, um, where's my arcade games, which is Final Burn. Come over here. Some of these have box art. A lot of them do actually have box art. Who created them? Some of them don't, like this one. 
get started. It'll bring up a quick preview of that or master system. It doesn't matter. It's slow because I'm, it's got all those thumbnails and stuff. That's why I use the desktop interface because this is a little slow. Now, you might have noticed when you press the home button while you're inside a game, it brings up a new menu that you haven't seen before. This is a this is um this is called your quick menu. And your quick menu is just for this game and this system that you're playing. And if you go back and go back a couple of times, we can go all the way back up here to the top, you'll see me main menu. Now there's another thing on top called the quick menu. So remember, main menu and settings and all this stuff over here. This is for the entire RetroArch. If you go to Main Menu and go to Quick Menu, this is for the game and the core that you have currently loaded. So just think of it that way. Once you're in here, you are doing overrides specifically for this game. So we have our options here. And after you like come in and be like, okay, I wanna change a few things, change some controls if you wanted to, change the way things work, you could change all this stuff, change the sound output, whatever. And once you're finished, you can create a game options file. Now, what that's done is all the stuff I've done inside the quick menu, the latency, controls, anything else I've changed. If I want to do shaders, you know, like I can come in and be like, okay, I want to apply uh, CRT filters to this. Let's, uh, I've got a few different ones that I've already created here, shader parameters. We can come in and mess with that. I'm just going to load up one that I made. Let's do uh, this one. Uh, that looks all right. And then we can just come up to options. It's always under options, create a game file. And every time you press the create a game file button, it overwrites the game file with whatever changes you've made. So every time you load this game, it's going to um, use this options, this game file config or this game config or whatever, and load up everything so you never have to do this again. All right, let's talk about something that's really important and that's input lag latency. It's a little weird because on most emulators, there's a tiny bit of latency. Like when you press the jump button, it's like a couple of frames later that the jump actually happens. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes the feel of the game just, it feels a little sloppy, almost like you're playing a jump game. So what you need to do to fix your input latency is press the P button to pause. And remember I said we're gonna be using P and K quite a bit. So now that we're paused, we can issue commands. Like I'm gonna press the jump button and I'm gonna hold it down. Now the K button, it goes forward one frame. So when you press K, okay, nothing happened. I pressed it once, K, again, nothing happened. So that's two frames of delay. Press it again, there we go, the animation has started. So we know we have two frames of delay, and then on the third frame, Mario actually jumps. So what we can do now is, you know, go to our quick menu, go down to latency, and the run ahead uh, latency, turn that on. And then I'm gonna put it on, you need to put it on two frames, because remember there was two empty frames, and then on the third frame, there was an animation. So as soon as the animation starts, that's when you know. And uh, you can use a second instance for run ahead, and that'll help if you're using quick save for any audio stuttering and that sort of thing. If you don't leave this on, and you're using the run ahead uh, latency, it can create stuttering when you're using saves and loads and stuff like that. So I leave that on. This is something that you're gonna need a more powerful computer for, especially when it comes to N64 and stuff like that. But with you know Super Nintendo, regular Nintendo, Master System, Genesis, whatever, Mega Drive, it should be just fine. So anyway, let's try that again. We're back in the game. Pause again. Now watch this. Jump button. Press K once. Look at that. No latency whatsoever. This is as good or better than playing it on the original hardware. It's gonna feel, it feels good. Oh, it feels so good. It's so weird once you've gotten used to playing emulators with a little bit of latency to all of a sudden <laughs> not have any latency. It's like, what? This is what I've been missing? It's still gonna be hard. <laughs> I, I picked an ice level to show everybody what the latency's like and I'm slipping and sliding <laughs> all over the place. This is the bad level. All right, so you notice my uh, screen, when I opened up this game, it loaded up a bunch of options and you can see I've got a filter on here. It's not an extreme filter, but it just gives it a slight CRT effect. Um, it's not the same, I've got a CRT, it's not quite the same as playing on a CRT, but I think it makes it look a little bit more like I remember it back in the day. And you can spend a lot of time messing around with this, so I'll make a separate video talking about different CRT filters and stuff. Because these games, 
they don't, in my opinion, they don't look right when you play them on an, an LCD without a filter like this. But you can do a lot of stuff on a regular flat screen LCD just by applying filters. We've got a lot of technology. Um, it's not going to give you the same feel of depth. There's something about those old cathode ray tubes that gave you, that made you feel like the image was a little deeper. I don't know. Well, you'll hopefully you won't uh, go out and spend a ton of money on a CRT. But hey, I got one for free by looking on Craigslist. Got totally lucky. So maybe that'll happen to you as well. But anyway, let's see. Let's open this up. Right, we're in the game here. Let's try a few different things and mess it around just a little. So I've got my uh, global overrides here. All right, so in your options menu, you can create an override by saving the game option file just for this game. Now, if you want to create an options file that saves um, all of the changes you've made and you want to save it for, say, like every Nintendo game or every Super Nintendo game, it'll always be that way. If you go back down to the quick menu, go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see overrides. And you can do a save core overrides. You can do game overrides or you can do core. So what that'll do is every time you load up any Super Nintendo game, it'll apply your controls, your latency options here. Almost every Nintendo game or Super Nintendo game has two frames of latency. You can, you know, have whatever you have here, all your different options and stuff. I've got a CRT shader on there and any Super Nintendo game that I load up is going to immediately load up all of those options and that'll be it. Oh, so we got to fight the boss. That sounds fun. I highly recommend this. This is Return to Dinosaur Island. And there's a damn ice world. I was really thinking when I was playing Super Mario World, is, you know what this needs? This needs a really annoying, slippery, floored ice world. That's exactly what this needs. <laughs> it feels so good to play this without any latency because I'm used to a little bit of latency in my emulators. Even with this wireless, uh, you know, controller I'm using right here, there is no latency. This feels so good. I always wondered, like, why are these games a little bit harder than they used to be? That's because, oh, I was playing with a little bit of input latency and it made things feel weird. I had to adjust how I was moving and jumping. So be sure to mess with that latency on every game. Again, set up some cheats with it. This is like a game genie. I don't really use any cheats, so sorry that's beyond the scope of this video because I don't use it and don't know much about it. I want to talk about Nintendo DS emulation for just a minute because it's very strange to do this vertical dual screen alignment on a 16 by 9 monitor. I could probably make a separate video about this. Maybe I will. But anyway, let's go ahead and click on it. Let's configure this. Hit the uh, home button to bring up the quick menu, of course. And then let's go down to options and we can control a lot of stuff here in our core. CPU cores, use all four of them. Why not? And then uh, we have the different resolutions and stuff. You could bump that up if you wanted to, you know, change it, make it a little bit higher since we're on a bigger screen. I normally don't like changing the original resolution, but I think that these dual screen games were never meant to be played on these huge screens. So bumping it up a little bit, you can mess around with it and see what looks good. And then we can come down and try some different uh, layouts and that sort of thing. So, all right, so I realized the wrong screen is on top. Let's do hybrid bottom. There we go. And then I've also gone in and turned hybrid show both screens because I only need left and right. If you do hybrid show both screens, it'll show both of your screens over here. How do I move? Oh, I got to tap on the stylus. You can't move around. What the hell? So I'm moving around like I'm playing Diablo. I haven't played this as you can see, but it's working. It looks a lot better like in this layout. I had no idea you use the stylus to move in this game. So anyway, the DS looks great. I'll go through them. I'll just go down to the bottom there. Remember, if it's running stuttery, you're going to need to make sure that uh, your internal resolution is, is low enough. That's the end of the video. Thanks to the sponsor. Thanks to everybody for watching. Um, if you want to see more RetroArch videos, let me know exactly what you want to do. And we can talk about that. And I know there's a lot of videos out there on the internet that have uh, similar topics go covering the same sort of stuff. But I think I've covered some things here that are unique, especially in the DOS video, the DOS Box Pure. Watch those other videos. I'm going to continue to make a few more Retro Arch videos, even if the information is, you know, can be found elsewhere. I think it'll be nice to have it all here in one spot so you can just go through our entire Retro Arch 101 series is what it's going to be called. And just watch each video, learn a little bit, or just click on the one that has the information that you need. And then use a lot of your hardware to do some cool stuff like play old games.
keep the history alive, keep the games alive. If you're someone who's making games, this is a great way to go back and remember what was really good about some of the older games and also some of the stuff maybe you think is not so good. Good history lesson. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Let me know what you think in the comments. We'll see you later.